comes in us. Nourish us. Oh Lord, how we know we need it. We pray, Lord, that it would just take a life of its own within us as we live and breathe your word and our witnesses of Jesus Christ in this world. Amen. Finnegan returned to his old hometown on a visit. And while he was there, he looked up his old friend, Hennessy, who had the general store, and he noticed as he went in that the two display windows were completely jammed with soap. And the two old friends greeted one another, and as they did so, Finnegan saw that every single shelf in the store was lined with soap. Gosh, he said, you've certainly got a lot of soap. You think so? Look at this. He took Finnegan through to the storeroom, which was also totally full of soap. Now come with me. Hennessy lifted a trap door and took him down some steps into a huge cellar, which was jammed with soap from floor to ceiling. Gee, you must really sell a lot of soap. No, I don't actually, the answer came. But the fellow that sold it to me, wow, can he sell soap. <laughs> Have you ever been challenged in your Christian experience, maybe by somebody we might call a salesman or a saleswoman? Have you at one point or another come close to a teaching that maybe made you think, hey, you know, I've never heard that. Why isn't that part of my experience? Maybe it came from a speaker on TV or radio or another Christian who believes that something that you've never embraced uh, if you've been part of or observed the diversity of ideas within the Christian church for any amount of time at all, you probably have an example you could speak of. Does anybody have one that you want to share today? I bring my microphone to you. If anybody has one? I thought you were going to raise your hand. Anybody? Nobody at all, huh? Well, maybe that's a good thing. I can tell you my own experience when I was uh, uh, just out of college. I took on a position at a Christian radio station. And as you can imagine, uh, as being part of the staff there, I was part of a team of, of believers who came from many different persuasions, but many more of them, I would say, had charismatic leanings. And sometimes I, as a United Methodist, felt just a little bit out of place. And I heard some really interesting ideas that I just listened to on the radio program mainly interesting things I would note about the Holy Spirit and what the speaker believed was the norm, in fact, the required to be Christians. And I talked to some callers who would call the station, uh, mainly young people, who were called in, some, some of them quite concerned that uh, a friend had told them about something she needed to have in her Christian experience. And as you can imagine, taking that call, I was kind of glad I got the call versus maybe somebody else. But there's so many questions that abound today about a subject that for Paul was so very straightforward. And that subject, of course, is Jesus. It's amazing how we as human beings can take something so simple, namely what God did so faithfully in Jesus, and add so many things to it. In that part of the world, in that time, there was Judaism, there were Greek philosophies, there was the world of Roman gods with all of their demands, and now there was this new Christian proclamation which was still sort of being worked out. And all of that added up to a whole bunch of confusion about what exactly is Christian teaching. In the heart of today's reading, verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2, tells us how important it is that we lay down a firm foundation. He speaks both in architectural uh, language and gardening language, helping to illustrate how easily it is that we can be swept off our feet. What happens to a structure that's not built on a firm foundation? Somebody say it falls down? Doesn't stand up very well, does it? In 1992, I love this story, Dade County, Florida, there was a reporter who walked up to a man amid all the debris and devastation that was left by Hurricane Andrew. He asked him, why was his house still standing? I feel like I'm popping a little bit. You might want to turn me down here a little bit. This house had withstood the storm 
while all the other homes in the way of the hurricane were absolutely devastating. How did he manage to escape the damage of the hurricane? And the man explained how he had built the house himself according to the Florida State Building Code. <laughs> and he was told that a house that was built to that code could withstand the hurricane. So he followed it exactly. His house was built on the right foundation. Now we who are architects may also know about the importance of firm roots. Deeper roots enable a plant to make it through dry spells longer. Trees with deeper roots are not so easily toppled in a windstorm. Now, in our day, and in our culture, there is a prejudice against the Christian faith in our nation. It's come about largely through the introduction of Eastern religions like Buddhism and Hinduism into our culture, which began several decades ago. And we are seeing a rapid growth in the number of practicing Buddhists and Hindus in our nation. The American Religious Identification Survey has estimated that the number of adherents to Buddhism in our nation rose by 170% between 1990 and the year 2000. And there's no sign that that rapid growth is going to slow down too soon. So our day, as well as the day that Paul is writing this letter to this church, is a day full of much confusion. While there was a day not so long ago when the majority of children grew up with regular exposure to a religious community, those children are in the minority now. Did you hear me? The minority. I'm so thrilled with the number of parents and grandparents that we have committed to their children being here in Sunday school, in junior church, and just being here in worship regularly. Because parents and grandparents, it's up to us. Where are our kids going to get a firm foundation in the faith if we're not taking the responsibility to do it? Our schools aren't going to do it. Is Hollywood going to do it? No, Hollywood's not going to do it. Don't look to Washington, D.C. either, because they're not going to do it. Let's not dare let our children and our grandchildren grow up and just be content to let the chips fall where they may in their religious life and in their formal religious training. Because if Jesus is, as we believe and as Paul wrote earlier in this letter, the fullness of God in flesh, now supreme in all of the universe, how can we just so easily shrug it off? So this is it, Paul says to us in verse 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. The first step here, says Paul, is receiving Jesus Christ as Lord. It's to accept His teaching above all the other philosophies and religions of the day. It's to make His teachings the central thrust, the central control of our life. And the second step is to live our lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as we were taught. In order to root ourselves in Christ, we have to know His teachings. For us, that means we have to read the owner's manual. Who here loves to read the owner's manual of your new car? I hear a lot of snickers. Maybe when you have to find something out, huh? Anybody here ever read through a whole, a whole book? No, probably not the pretty thick these days. But we have to read the manual. We've got to study the way of Christ that's taught in our scriptures. We've got to learn them and follow them and love them above all of the teachings. And that's pretty tough because it is a difficult book. And it's sometimes very difficult to know exactly what it is saying to us in 2013. That's why study is so important. It sounds simple. And yet a lot of times its teaching seems to conflict with how we actually live. Chester's G.K. Chesterton said years ago that Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. So this business of living ourselves, living our lives in Christ, and rooting ourselves in Christ, building ourselves up in Christ, and establishing ourselves in the faith is not quite as simple as we might think it or hope it would be. That's why we need brothers and sisters who are fellow pilgrims to walk along the way with us. And finally, Paul tells us to abound in thanksgiving. The greeting of the letter to the church at Colossae also mentioned this, you remember. It, Paul mentioned it in the petitions that he was continually praying for the Colossians. 
that they would be offering a lives full of joyful thanksgiving to the Father who's qualified them and qualified us to share in the wonderful inheritance of his holy people. I think Reverend Don Chesser says it in words that are tough to improve upon. She says, living with gratitude really is central to the practice of the Christian faith. This is not a simple thing either. It's not just remembering to say thank you. Rather, it is truly understanding our lives, our families, our friends, our health, our minds, our possessions, everything we have as a gift from God. It's not ever letting ourselves think that we for a moment deserve all this or that we've earned it because we're righteous or we're good or special or that it all just can't be taken away from us in the blink of an eye because we know it so easily. That's the kind of thanksgiving that Paul is talking about. Paul in verse 9 and 10 looks back and reminds us of what we heard about last week, about Jesus. That in Him all of the fullness of the divine dwells, and we in coming to Him have come to Him in His fullness. There is nothing lacking of divinity in Him, and in the same way there is nothing lacking in His humanity either. There isn't anything that we would need that isn't already included in the package Jesus gives us. And now he turns to us, and then he shares with the Colossians and, our, and us how our lives are changed in him. Verse 11, he talks about circumcision that may, very well may speak to the Jewish controversy about requiring it among the new Gentile converts. And in fact, it could be one of the controversies that uh, motivated Paul to write this letter. Paul is telling the Colossians, we have a new circumcision in baptism. Baptism now is our initiation into the body of Christ. And through baptism, we aren't just putting off a tiny bit of flesh like males do in circumcision. We are now putting off an entire way of life that leads to death. And we receive new life in Christ that gets rooted and nourished from those roots. The disarming of the rulers and authorities and making a public example of them that he mentions in the last part of this section refers to the practice of a victorious army bringing home the spoils of war, making a public spectacle of them as they parade through all the prisoners, all the loot, and then if they were so fortunate to be able to do so, they would bring forward to parade before everybody the king of the now defeated country who would be quickly beheaded and done and over Paul's claiming that God did that, ironically, in the spectacle of the dying Jesus on the cross. Remember, probably remember the vision of Saddam Hussein's statue being torn down, what was it, 2002, 2003, when uh, the country went to war over there in Iraq, it's something similar to that. But nobody would suspect in the moment that the Romans were being victorious over Jesus' life, that God was disarming all of the rulers and principalities and putting them up for show and humiliation. And yet that's what Paul said is actually happening. happening. All that may be said against us and our sin as a result has been dealt with by God. The law has no more sway over us, he tells us. And the end of all of this for the Colossians and us is not to be tripped up by persons Salespeople, we might say, who are wanting to get our attention on anything other than Jesus. Paul mentions requiring certain observances, certain rituals. He mentions Sabbaths, new moons, festivals, food and drink. He's maybe talking of things he knows that they have been asked about, or things that he just fears that they're going to be confronted with. I don't think it can be any clearer that simple trust in Jesus' accomplishments is all we need. And yet today we know that there are various groups that want to add something to it, or at least they put the focus on something beyond Jesus. We have Seventh-day Sabbath-keeping groups. He didn't, but he could have mentioned folks who focus on dress, jewelry, the lack of maybe, tattoos, hair, whatever it is. He could have mentioned for our day charismatic experiences or any number of unique experiences that someone has and wants everybody to experience. Soon he or she is saying that that's what you've got to have in order to be a follower of Christ. But when we have Christ, there is nothing more that's needed. 
we found the treasure of the world. Indeed, in Jesus Christ, we found the treasure of the universe. And Paul encourages us with these words that I want to encourage you with today. We won't ever be disqualified as long as we are rooted and holding fast to Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we uh, sing in response to